Thank you for studying the Bible with us at BBN. Please support our ministry by sharing a financial gift with us today. Now, here is your lesson from the BBN BI. In Daniel chapters 8 through 12, we have God's sovereign rule over the nation of Israel demonstrated. In chapter 8, God gave Daniel a vision in which God revealed his chastening program for Israel in the near future, more specifically, when Israel would be under the dominion of Medo-Persia and Greece. But in this particular session, as we come to Daniel chapter 9, we have presented to us God's extended future program for the nation of Israel. His extended future program for the nation of Israel. In the first major division of chapter 9, which is contained in verses 1 and 2, we have presented to us Daniel's inquisitive research. Daniel says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus of Median descent, who was made king over the kingdom of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, 70 years. Daniel began to do some inquisitive research in various Old Testament books in the year 538 B.C. Now, this is only about one year after Babylon had fallen to the Medo-Persians. Now that Babylon had fallen, evidently Daniel had a large question mark in his mind once again to this extent. Lord, how much longer will your people of Israel be held captive here in the land of Babylon? Our conquerors have fallen to a new conqueror. Is the time of the end of the Babylonian captivity for your people almost here? And so with great inquisitiveness, he began to examine the Old Testament prophets to see if any of the earlier prophets had received revelation from God concerning how long the Babylonian captivity of the Jews was to last. And sure enough, as he was reading the prophet Jeremiah, who had written before Daniel's day, he found two passages in Jeremiah where God had foretold that the people of Israel would be held captive in the land of Babylon for 70 years. Those two passages are Jeremiah, chapter 25, verses 11 and 12, and Jeremiah, chapter 29, verses 10 through 14. Israel was to be held captive in the land of Babylon for 70 years. This brings us to the second section of Daniel, chapter 9, which we could entitle Daniel's Penitent Prayer. Daniel's penitent prayer, chapter 9, verses 3 through 19. Daniel tells us in verse 3, So I gave my attention to the Lord God, to seek him by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. And then, beginning with verse 4, and going through verse 19, Daniel records his prayer unto God. Now, this prayer has two major emphases associated with it. First, in verses 4 through 15, we have a prayer of confession. As Daniel pours out his heart to God and confesses the sins of his people of Israel against God, the sins that took them captive to the land of Babylon. And then in verses 16 through 19, we have a prayer of supplication. As Daniel bombards the throne of God with petition and asks God to forgive the sins of the people of Israel and to restore the nation and the capital city of Jerusalem to their former estate that they had before the Babylonians carried the Jews captive and before the Babylonians had leveled the city of Jerusalem to the ground. A prayer of confession and a prayer of supplication. Now again, we could ask a question. Why did Daniel pray so intently 
about the sins of Israel and requests for God to restore the nation and Jerusalem to their former estate or glory. Well, the reason is this. He had just read in Jeremiah that the Babylonian captivity of the Jews was to last for 70 years. At the time that Daniel read that in Jeremiah, 68 of those 70 years had already transpired. Only two more years to go for the Jews to be held captive in Babylon. But Daniel also read in Jeremiah that although God said to the Jews, I shall restore you in 70 years, you must repent and confess your sins to me before I restore you. And you will repent and confess in order for me to restore you to the homeland in 70 years. And since that was the requirement for the captivity to end, and there were only two more years left before the captivity was supposed to end, Daniel himself began doing the very thing necessary for God to end the Babylonian captivity of the Jews. And he repented on behalf of his people. He confessed the sins of Israel. And he literally bombarded the throne of God. Look at verse 19. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and take action. For thine own sake, O my God, do not delay, because thy city and thy people are called by thy name. He is literally bombarding God's throne in heaven with this petition. For God to take action on behalf of his people. Hear his confession of repentance for Israel and begin to restore the people and to have their capital city of Jerusalem rebuilt. Now this brings us to the third section of Daniel chapter 9, which we could entitle, God Sends a Messenger. Chapter 9, verses 20 through 23. Before Daniel could even finish his prayer, God sent the angel Gabriel in the form of a man to Daniel, and Gabriel reached Daniel around 3 or 4 p.m. in the afternoon from what Daniel tells us here in verses 20 through 23. And Gabriel tells Daniel why he was sent by God to this great prophet of God. Daniel was still having a lot of confusion in his mind in light of the visions that he had received from God about all the great Gentile world empires that were yet to come even after Babylon's day. And he was still wondering, Lord, We've already been chastened as the people of Israel under the Babylonians. If our Babylonian captivity is about to end in just two more years, then why this revelation concerning three more great Gentile world empires that are going to dominate us as your special people? I'm confused. If our captivity is about to end, then why is it we shall continue to exist under three more Gentile world empire. Gabriel tells Daniel, I've been sent to you, beloved one of God, by the Lord, to clear up your confusion. And in essence, Gabriel is going to give further revelation to Daniel. And through this revelation, indicate to Daniel that the Babylonian captivity was only the first part of God's indignation or chastening of his people of Israel. The latter part of God's indignation or chastening of the nation of Israel was going to take place after the Babylonian captivity, while the next several Gentile world empires would dominate the world. God, even when he would end the Babylonian captivity of the Jews, would not yet be done with the chastening program that he had in mind for his unique Old Testament people of Israel. And that brings us to the the fourth and final division of chapter 9 that we really want to focus our attention upon in this particular session. This fourth division is contained in verses 24 through 27, and we could entitle this God's Revelation to Daniel. God's Revelation to Daniel. In this particular passage, God reveals to Daniel that he would continue to chasten the nation of Israel 
for at least 70 more weeks, literally 70 sevens. After the Babylonian captivity would end, there would be at least 70 times seven more times of God chastening the nation of Israel. This is a prophecy concerning God's extended future program for the nation of Israel, and this prophecy is one of the most amazing in all of the Old Testament scriptures. One of the reasons that it is so amazing is we're going to see that in this particular prophecy, God revealed the precise time that Messiah would be here in the world in his first coming. We're going to see exact, precise time that God reveals here as to when the Messiah would be here, presenting himself to the people of Israel in his first coming as their prince or as their king. I think it's very fitting that it is the angel Gabriel who from God delivers this new revelation concerning the exact time the Messiah would be here in his first coming because remember it was also the same angel Gabriel who came to the Virgin Mary and announced to her that she was God's chosen vessel through whom the Messiah would be born into the world. If we are to understand properly the revelation that is contained in verses 24 through 27, there are several important things to note about this particular prophecy. The first important thing to note is in verse 24, and that is the fact that this prophecy deals totally with Daniel's people of Israel and their capital city of Jerusalem. Notice what Gabriel says, verse 24, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people, Daniel's people, that's the people of Israel, and your holy city. The holy city of the Jewish people was the city of Jerusalem. In other words, everything in this particular prophecy must be applied completely to the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. And to apply any part of this prophecy to any other city or any other people is to violate this passage of Scripture. Second important thing to note about this prophecy, again in verse 24, is the period of time that is covered by this particular prophecy. How long of a period of time is involved in this prophecy? Gabriel said to Daniel, verse 24, 70 weeks have been determined for your people and your holy city. The period of time involved in this prophecy is 70 weeks. The word weeks in the Hebrew language is literally sevens. What Gabriel said literally was, seventy sevens are determined for the people of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. In other words, there will be seventy periods of time, and each one of those seventy periods of time will consist of seven units. Seventy sevens are determined for your people and your holy city. Seventy sevens of what? Seventy sevens of years are determined for your people and your holy city. You may recall that the, the Jewish people, under the law system that God had given to them, were accustomed to thinking in seven-year segments. Because under the law system, God told the people of Israel that every seventh year they were to allow the land to rest and not till the soil and grow crops. Every seventh year was a sabbatic year. And the Jews were accustomed to thinking that way in Old Testament times. And so God is saying here to Daniel, 70 periods, each one consisting of seven years, have been determined for the people of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. Now 70 times 7 is 490. So God was saying here, there are going to be 490 more years, at least 490 more years of my chastening the people of Israel and their city of Jerusalem, even after the Babylonian captivity has ended for the Jews. 
That's the period of time covered by this prophecy. 490 years. The third significant thing we see in this prophecy, and again this is in verse 24, is this. These 490 years would be necessary to accomplish six things for the people of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. The 490 years would be necessary to accomplish six things for the people of Israel and the city of Jerusalem. And all six things are presented in verse 24. The first thing mentioned is this. He says, 70 weeks have been determined, number one, to finish the transgression. He's referring to one specific transgression of the people of Israel. What Gabriel is saying here is this. It's going to take those 490 additional years of chastening of Israel by God to put a stop to Israel's sin of rebellion against God and his Messiah. It won't be until those 490 years of chastening in the future have transpired that Israel will finally stop its sin of rebellion against God. The second thing it would take these 490 years to accomplish, and I'm going to give you a very literal translation here, to hide sin from sight. To hide sin from sight. The idea of God hiding Israel's sin from his sight. And the implication is that it won't be until Israel has been chastened for these next 490 years that God will hide Israel's sin from his sight and not recognize it anymore. The third thing it would take these 490 years to accomplish is this, to make atonement for iniquity. To make atonement for iniquity. Now it is a fact of history that the Lord Jesus made atonement for all human sin, even Israel's sin, over 1900 years ago when he died on the cross of Calvary. But it's also a teaching of the Word of God that that atoning work of Jesus Christ for the sin of the nation of Israel will not be fully applied to the nation of Israel as a whole until the nation of Israel stops her rebellion against God and repents and turns to Jesus Christ her Messiah and receives him as her Messiah and Savior. And that again will not take place until these 490 additional years of the chastening of Israel had transpired. The fourth thing it would take the 490 years to accomplish is this, to bring in everlasting righteousness. Literally, to bring in the righteousness of the ages. This is referring to the, the establishment of the rule of righteousness on planet Earth. In other words, the future millennial rule of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. When he comes, he will establish on planet Earth a rule of absolute righteousness, the kind of righteousness that has characterized God throughout all the ages. Gabriel is saying, it's not until Israel has been chastened for these 490 additional years that Messiah will come and establish the rule of everlasting righteousness of the coming millennial kingdom. The fifth thing it would take these 490 years to accomplish is this, to seal up vision and prophecy. The idea is to fulfill the visions and prophecies concerning Israel's chastening wouldn't be until these 490 years had transpired that all the visions and prophecies concerning the future chastening of the nation of Israel by God would be completely fulfilled. And the sixth and final thing that it would take these 490 years to accomplish is to anoint the most holy. Now there are two possibilities of what is meant by this. One thing this may mean is to anoint the holy place in Jerusalem where the millennial temple is to be built. The scriptures do make it clear that the Jews are going to build a new temple of God for the coming millennium. And Gabriel may be saying it's going to take these 490 years of chastening of Israel before we can anoint the holy place where that new temple of God is to be built. But there's another possibility what this means. It may be referring to the anointing of the most holy one. The idea being that of anointing the Messiah 
as he returns and through that special anointing is installed into office as the king of all kings and the lord of all lords. Either way you take it, again the idea is the millennial reign of the Messiah cannot be established until these 490 years of the future chastening of Israel have transpired, have been fulfilled. The fourth major thing that we see concerning this prophecy, and this is contained in verse 25, is the starting point of these 490 years. Now they hadn't started yet when Daniel had received this revelation from God. They were going to start sometime beyond this year of 538 B.C., when were these 490 future years of the chastening of Israel to begin officially from God's way of reckoning time? Gabriel says to Daniel, verse 25, So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It, Jerusalem, will be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. Gabriel is saying here that the starting point of these 490 years would be the time in history when a decree would be issued for the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Babylonians in 587 or 586 B.C., a number of years before Daniel received this revelation. Gabriel is saying, when the decree is given for the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem, the date of the issuance of that decree will be the official starting point of these 490 years of the future chastening of Israel. Now we've got a problem, because when we go back to ancient history, we find that while Medo-Persia was ruling the people of Israel, there were several Medo-Persian decrees issued allowing the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. Not just one, but just one, we know right away which decree, but there were several issued by Medo-Persian kings. Which one of those several decrees? is the specific decree that Gabriel has in mind here that starts the 490 years. Well, thankfully, he says at the end of verse 25, Jerusalem will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. The word that is translated moat is referring actually to a wall that would be built around Jerusalem when it would be rebuilt during the times of Medo-Persian rule. Thankfully, only one of the Medo-Persian decrees allowing the rebuilding of Jerusalem permitted the rebuilding of the wall around Jerusalem. And that particular decree is the decree that King Artaxerxes, one of the ancient Medo-Persian kings, issued to Nehemiah. And that decree is recorded for us in the book of Nehemiah, chapter 2. And when you go back to Nehemiah, chapter 2, we are told the month and even the year in which that decree was issued, it was issued in the month of March, 445 B.C. So, Gabriel is saying that God will start this 490-year period in the month of March, 445 B.C. That would be the starting point of these future 490 years of God chasing Israel. March, 445 B.C. The fifth major thing we notice about this prophecy, and this again is in verse 25, is the time when Messiah would appear as the Prince of Israel. Gabriel says to Daniel, verse 25, so you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree, March 445 B.C., to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. Seven plus sixty-two is sixty-nine sevens. Gabriel is saying, from March 445 B.C. 
until Messiah the Prince will be here to the nation of Israel, 69 of the 70 periods of seven years will have transpired. Now, 7 times 69 is 483. In other words, from March 445 B.C. until Messiah the Prince would be here presenting himself as king to the nation of Israel, the first 483 of the 490 years would have transpired, leaving only seven more years to go. It starts counting off March of 445 B.C., and count up 483 years and Messiah would be here in the world presenting himself to Israel as Israel's king. Now the question is often asked, why does Gabriel divide those 69 weeks into two divisions? Seven weeks plus 62 weeks. Many are convinced that the seven weeks, which would be 49 years altogether, is the amount of time it took the Jews to rebuild Jerusalem with a wall completely around it. In other words, from the time Artaxerxes issued the decree allowing the city to be rebuilt together with its wall, it took the Jews approximately 49 years. But the important thing we've got to see here is that God is revealing to Daniel through the angel Gabriel the exact time when Messiah would be here in the world and presenting himself to the nation of Israel as its Messiah. Now, Back around the turn of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s, there was a Scotland Yard detective, very devoted Christian, believer in the Word of God, by the name of Sir Robert Anderson. And Sir Robert Anderson was quite a student of the Scriptures, and of course, being a detective, he liked to track down and solve difficult mysteries. And he was a detailed man. Sir Robert Anderson sat down with the chronology given here in verse 25 and he figured out exactly when would these first 69 weeks of years, these first 483 years end, exactly when was it that Messiah was here presenting himself to the nation of Israel as its prince. And I'm not going to even try to begin describing all the details of computations. It becomes extremely complex. Because people in ancient times figured out their year is altogether different from the way we do now. And you have to take into account uh, days missed for leap years and all the rest, and how you shift from B.C. to A.D., and from the old calendar system followed in ancient times to the more modern calendar system that we follow today. But Sir Robert Anderson, figuring this out and all the details he did intensive research, came to the conclusion that starting with March 445 B.C., and counting up the first 483 of the 490 years, you end up with April 32 A.D. That Messiah would be here in the world, presenting himself to Israel as her prince in April of 32 A.D. Now what would be so significant about that particular day? the last day of the 483 years when Messiah would present himself to the nation of Israel. So Robert Anderson became convinced that this was the day that Jesus made his triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem. Because on that day, Palm Sunday, he was officially presenting himself to the nation of Israel as its prince, as its king. The prophet Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9 told Israel, How shall you know your king? He will come to you riding on the back of the foal of an ass. And that's exactly what Jesus wrote upon on Palm Sunday in his triumphal entry. And in light of that Zechariah 9, 9 prophecy, this was his way of saying to Israel, I am your prince, your king. I am presenting myself officially to you today as your king. With that in mind, please look, if you would, at the account that Luke gives us of Jesus' triumphal entry as recorded in Luke chapter 19 and particularly beginning with verse 41 and going through verse 44. Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44. Luke says, when he approached, when Jesus approached the city, he saw the city 
Jerusalem and wept over it, saying, now notice the language, if you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Jesus was implying to the Jews in the city of Jerusalem you should recognize what day this is. You should know that this is your special time of visitation by your prince, the one who can bring you peace. Why should Israel have known what day this was and that this was the time of their visitation by their prince? The reason is because God, back in Daniel chapter 9, had given precise chronology to tell Israel the exact day the exact time that Messiah would be in the midst of the nation of Israel and presenting himself to that nation as her prince, as her coming king. If you read on in verse 26, Gabriel says, Then after the 62 weeks, now remember there were seven weeks and then the 62 weeks, so this is another way of Gabriel saying after the first 69 weeks or after the first 483 years, Messiah will be cut off and have no one. Now, the cutting off of Messiah is referring to his crucifixion. When he ends up with no one, accompany him on the cross. The disciples forsook him. The nation had forsaken him. Even God the Father had to forsake him while he was the sin bearer. But notice Gabriel is saying that it would be after the first 483 years that Messiah would be crucified, be cut off. The implication, again, is whatever event it was that ended with the last day of the first 483 years, that event would transpire before his crucifixion. Again, on the basis of that, Sir Robert Anderson concluded that the event that ended the first 483 years was the triumphal entry of the Lord Jesus into the city of Jerusalem in April of 32 A.D., and that therefore Jesus was also crucified in April of 32 A.D. Now, do we have any New Testament chronology, particularly in the Gospels, that would verify that Jesus made his triumphal entry and was also crucified in the spring of 32 A.D.? Yes, we do. There are at least two chronological factors in the New Testament that indicate that Jesus was crucified in the spring of 32 A.D. Let me deal with just one of them, because we are limited on time. Look, if you would, at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Luke says, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Iturea, and Trachonitis and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. Luke is saying, John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Messiah, began his ministry in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the emperor of Rome. Now, from ancient Roman records, we know what year Tiberius Caesar began his reign. Tiberius Caesar became the new emperor of Rome in the year 14 A.D. Now, to the Roman way of reckoning, you always counted the year that a Roman emperor came to the throne as the first year of his reign. So, 14 A.D. was the first year of Tiberius' reign. Taking 14 A.D. as the first year and counting up 15 years, the 15th year of Tiberius' reign was 28 A.D. That's when John the Baptist began his ministry, preparing the way for the Messiah. 28 A.D. If you examine the record of the earliest messages that John the Baptist preached at the very beginning of his ministry, you will find that he used illustrations that were true 
of agriculture in Israel in the spring of the year. On that basis, Bible scholars are convinced that John the Baptist began his ministry in the spring of the year. We can conclude then that John began his ministry in the spring of 28 AD. Now obviously it would take him several months to establish his ministry before Messiah would be officially presented in his public ministry, before he would be baptized by John the Baptist. I think we are safe in concluding that John probably baptized Jesus in the fall of 28 AD, so that Jesus would have begun his public ministry in the fall of 28 AD. We know that Jesus ministered for three and one half years. Once he was baptized by John, Jesus ministered for three and one half years. Now follow the computing here. If Jesus began his public ministry in the fall of 28 AD, you add three years onto that, that brings you to the fall of 31 AD, you add another half year to that, and that brings you to the spring of 32 AD, that Jesus made his triumphal entry and was crucified. The spring of 32 AD. Interestingly, during the the 300s A.D., there was a prominent church leader on the island of Cyprus, a bishop called Epiphanius, who wrote some writings about the life of the Lord Jesus. Translations of his writings are available today. And this church bishop, living in the 300s A.D., said, and notice, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in November of 28 A.D. And Jesus was crucified in the spring of 32 A.D. The chronology of the New Testament agrees with the chronology that was presented in this prophecy by God through Gabriel to the prophet Daniel in Daniel chapter 9. Messiah was here presenting himself as prince to the nation of Israel, and then was crucified in the spring of 32 A.D. This brings us to the sixth important thing we must note about this prophecy in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, and that is that the 70th week of years, now notice we've been dealing with the first 69 week of years, first 69 sevens, or 483 years, but the last week of years, the 70th week, the last seven years, does not follow immediately after the end of the 69th week of years. In other words, there's a gap of time between the end of the 69th week when Jesus made his triumphal entry and the beginning of the 70th week, the beginning of the last seven years of this future chasing of Israel. I would point out to you that it was quite a normal thing for prophecies in the Old Testament to have big gaps of time between one segment of the prophecy and the other. Just an example. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, that we like to quote so frequently in the Christmas season, notice what it says. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. What coming of Christ is that referring to? His first coming. But notice, we go on in the same prophecy. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. What coming of Christ is that referring to? His second coming. Notice, first coming and second coming put right together in the same prophecy. But from our historical perspective today, we know there is a tremendous gap of time between that first coming when he was born as a child and his second coming when the government will rest upon his shoulders. Not an unusual thing at all in Old Testament prophecy to have a huge gap of time between one part of the prophecy and the other, and that's exactly what we've got here. Now, there are several lines of evidence to prove that the 70th week did not follow immediately after the end of the 69th week. Let me give you just one line of evidence, because we are pressed for time. If the 70th week, seven-year period, were to follow immediately after the end of the 69th week, and that ended in 32 A.D., when would the 70th week have ended? 39 A.D. If the first 69 ended in 32 A.D., 
And then you got another seven years coming right after that, the 70th week, and then the 70th week would have ended in 39 A.D. Remember what we saw in verse 24? There are six things that have to happen to the nation of Israel before the 70 weeks end. One of them is Israel's got to stop her sin of rebellion against God. If the 70th week were to follow right after the end of the 69th week, Israel's sin of rebellion against God would have had to have ended by 39 A.D. And Messiah would have had to have brought in the rule of everlasting righteousness in 39 A.D. And it's a fact that Israel's sin of rebellion has not yet come to an end. And Messiah has not yet established God's rule of absolute righteousness in the world. This demonstrates that the 70th week of years did not follow immediately after the end of the 69th week. There's been a tremendous gap of time between 32 AD and the beginning of that 70, 70th week of years, and you and I are now living in that gap of time. The first 69 weeks of past history, they ended in 32 AD. The 70th week has not yet started. That is yet to come. That 70th week will be the future seven-year tribulation period. Seven years in duration. The last seven years before the second coming of the Lord Jesus back to planet Earth. The next significant thing that we see in this prophecy, and this is in verse 26. The people who would destroy Jerusalem in the future are described as a people who have a future prince coming. The people who would destroy Jerusalem in the future, beyond Daniel's day, are described as a people who have a future prince coming. Gabriel says, verse 26, And the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, when Daniel received this revelation, Jerusalem had already been destroyed many years before by Babylon. But when the Babylonian captivity ended, the Jews returned home, many of them, and they rebuilt Jerusalem. God is here foretelling a future destruction of the city of Jerusalem beyond Daniel's day. And he's saying the people who will destroy Jerusalem in the future, they will have a special prince who will come as well. Now, who were the people that would destroy Jerusalem in the future beyond Daniel's day? From our historical perspective today, we know who they were. They were the Roman people. For in 70 A.D., after Jesus had been crucified, the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And Gabriel is saying those Roman people are going to have a future prince who will come into the world and rule. Who is he? The coming Antichrist. The little horn of Daniel 7 that we noted several sessions ago who would be the last great ruler of the future revived Roman Empire in the world. The Roman people will have a future prince coming. The eighth significant thing we see in this prophecy is, when will this coming prince appear? When will he appear? When will the Antichrist be here as the ruler of the revived Roman Empire? Verse 27 answers that question for us. It says, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. For one week. For one period of seven. Now, the first 69 periods of seven are already past history. There's one more period of seven to go, the 70th week. Gabriel is saying the Antichrist will be here as the prince, the ruler of the revived Roman Empire by the beginning of that last week of years by the beginning of the 70th week of years, or as we know it today, by the beginning of the future tribulation period. What will the Antichrist do? This is the ninth thing we see, and this again is in verse 27. Several things he will do. First, he shall cause a covenant to prevail for the many for one week. I'm giving you a literal translation. He shall cause a covenant to prevail for thee many for one week. Beginning of verse 27. At the beginning of the 70th week, or at the beginning of the future tribulation period, Antichrist 
shall enforce a covenant that he will make with most of the Jews. Remember this prophecy is dealing with the Jews and the many here referring to Jewish people. At the beginning of the tribulation period, the Antichrist will enforce a covenant with the Jewish people, with most of them, with the many of them. Evidently, this covenant will not be accepted by all the Jews. Some of the Jews evidently will be opposed to their nation entering into a covenant with the ruler of the revived Roman Empire, but Antichrist is going to enforce that covenant with most of the Jews. From all we can discern, this covenant will be a political and religious covenant. Antichrist, as the head of the revived Roman Empire, politically will promise to protect the nation of Israel in the coming tribulation period if she's ever attacked by another power. Religiously, Antichrist will grant the Jews permission to restore their temple worship and reinstitute their animal sacrifices in that temple again as they had in Old Testament times. Second thing he will do, verse 27, is this. Halfway through the 70th week, or halfway through the tribulation period, he will break his covenant with Israel and force the Jews to stop their sacrifices. Gabriel says, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. He makes the covenant with Israel at the beginning of the tribulation period, but right in the middle of that seven-year period, after the first three and a half years have transpired, he breaks his covenant with the nation of Israel. And the third thing he will do, and let me again give you a literal translation here, upon the pinnacle of abomination, upon the pinnacle of abomination, one making desolate. A pinnacle, of course, is the highest point of something. Gabriel is saying here that once the Antichrist stops the worship of Jehovah in the rebuilt temple of the Jews of the future tribulation period, he will commit the worst or the pinnacle of all abominations against a temple of God. Now through the history of the temples of God among the Jews, there have been many abominations committed against God's temple. The Babylonians, committed an abomination against Solomon's temple when they desecrated it and destroyed it in 586 B.C. In our last session, we saw how Antiochus Epiphanes, that Greek Syrian ruler, committed an abomination against the, the temple the Jews built after they returned from their Babylonian captivity. Antiochus Epiphanes had a female pig offered on the altar of God in that rebuilt temple. That was an abomination of the temple of God. The Romans in 70 A.D., committed an abomination against Herod's temple of God when they desecrated it and destroyed it. But Gabriel is saying, of all the abominations committed against the temple of God, the one that the Antichrist will commit against that temple will be the worst of all the abominations, the pinnacle of all the abominations. What will it be? We already saw in our session two times ago that the Antichrist, in the middle of the tribulation period, will have an image of himself set up in the holy place of that tribulation period temple and will declare to the world that he is God and that everyone must worship him as God. That will be the worst of all the abominations committed against the temple of God. Now, our time is gone and we must cut it off at this point. There are a couple of other things we've got to see yet from this prophecy and Lord willing, we're going to have to deal with them in our next session.